In the previous video, we looked at the relationship between the loading applied and the shear force that would develop from that loading. And we came up with an equation, and it's repeated here, where the shear force for a given point is the shear force at the start of a section minus the integral of the loading along a section. And we're going to show using a numerical example where we're actually going to put some real numbers in, uh, dimensions in meters and loads in kilonewtons and show how we develop the shear force diagram going across a beam. So I have a beam here, this is example six in the notes. We have a uniformly distributed load W1 and that's on section AB. We have a uniformly distributed load W2 and that's section CD. And finally at the far end we have a point load F. The first thing we need to do when drawing a shear force diagram and later bending moment diagrams is identify the individual sections where we're going to get separate equations. And the way to do that is we walk along the beam and see where the loading changes. So we start off on this beam. The beam is overhanging. So there's no reaction force, but we do have the UDL starting at this point. And wherever a UDL starts is where we're going to get a change in the function we're developing. At point B, the UDL stops, and in addition to the UDL stopping, we're going to get a reaction force at B. If we continue along the beam now, we get the second uniformly distributed load starting at the point C. So we'll expect a new shear force function to start at this point, and that continues all the way along this central section till we get to point D. Then we have a further little section DE where we have no loading on it but we are expecting a different fun function for the shear force at this point. When we hit D again we're going to get vertical load coming from the reaction. We don't know whether this is pointing up or down at this moment but I'll, point, I'll assume it's pointing upwards. And then we move along from E and we have no load applied until we reach the far end F. And whenever we get a point load applied, it would be a reaction force or an external force, we would expect a change in the function at this point. So in total, we have one, two, three, four, five different portions of the beam to consider. So this will be a little bit time consuming. As ever, with all of the shear force examples, what we do need to know is what the reaction force is RBY and REYR. So we can then use those in the functions. So let's start off with calculating those reaction forces. And to calculate the reaction forces, we use the free body diagram of the entire beam. And so let's draw this free body diagram of the entire beam. So the entire beam, I'll scroll down a little bit so we can see. So we have RBY, we have a UDL, and we can take the total of that load to be applied at the centroid of this UDL and also at the centroid of the UDL W1. So I'll call that capital W1 this one capital W2 to show that it is the total load upon there. Then we have the reaction REY and finally we have the point load at point F which we've also called F and now let's su substitute some of the data that we actually have for this problem. So we know that the point load F is 10 kilonewtons. So let's put this on our free body diagram, 10 kilonewtons. We know that W2 is 2 kilonewtons per meter and it's acting for a length of 3 meters. So the total load will be 6 kilonewtons and the UDL W1 is 5 kilonewtons per meter acting over 
two meters. So five times two equals 10 kilonewtons. And to help now, we need some dimensions on this system. So we know that this acts at the centroid, so this will be one meter. We had a total of two meters before we had met B, so that's going to be one meter also. Then we have one meter until the UDLW2 starts, and one and a half meters to the centroid of W2, so that's going to be 2.5 meters. And likewise, it's then a further 2.5 meters until we meet the point E, where we have the reaction REY, and then we have a further three meters until we hit the end of the cantilever where the point load of 10 kilonewtons is applied. So let's just mark up on the graph on this free body diagram, we have the point B, which is pretty crucial, and the point E, which is pretty crucial. And the first thing that I'm gonna to do to calculate the reactions is I'm gonna take moments about point B. Try to keep the free body diagram on the screen, but I'm gonna run out of space pretty soon. So, taking moments about B. So I have, and I'll write longhand, even though I've done some changes to the free body diagram already. I had W1 multiplied by the length of 2 meters, and I'm going to multiply that by the lever arm from B, which is 1 meter. Then I have, going on, so here's the point we're taking moments from. Then I have REY which is also going in an anti-clockwise manner, just like this load here is. So I have R, E, Y, multiplied by the distance from B, which is five meters. And now I'll consider all of the clockwise moments and I'll do those on the right-hand side of the equation. So now I have W2 multiplied by the length over which it's acting which was three meters. So that's how I got six kilonewtons on the free body diagram. And the distance from B of 2.5 meters. And then also going in a clockwise direction, I have the 10 kilonewtons at the end of the beam and multiplied by the lever arm. So it's five meters plus three meters is eight meters in total from B. And now I'll substitute in for the distributed loads. And so we have 10 plus 5REY equals 15 plus 80. And rearrange that equation. So I had 95 minus 10 is going to be 85. Five, so R E Y equals eighty five divided by five, which equals seventeen kilonewtons. And to get the other reaction force, I'm going to choose to take the sum of the forces in the y direction. So I'll just quickly remind ourselves of the free body diagram. I have R. B, Y, and R, E, Y pointing upwards, and 10, 6, and 10 pointing downwards. So let's write that down. So upwards we have R, B, Y, plus R, E, Y is equal to the UDL multiplied by the length of beam on which it's acting, which we've already pre-calculated, plus W2, again, multiplied by the length of beam over which that is acting, and plus F. And we'll do the substitutions now. So this was 5 times 2, plus 2 times 3, plus 10. And then I'm going to rearrange this now so that I have R, 
B Y equals so I have 10 plus 6 plus 10 my minus 17 which is R E Y which I already know so then R B Y becomes 9 kilonewtons and at this point I'm not going to do it but you should apply another equation to check and I would suggest to check I would take moments about E and make sure that the calculated value of R B Y is the same as what I got by taking moments about B so check Take moments about E. And I'll put a question mark because you could take moments anywhere and still develop an equation that you could check at this point. So now we have the two reactions. Now what I'm gonna do is go along each section one by one and develop the shear force equation for that section of the beam. So, so for section a, B along the beam. I'm going to draw the free body diagram. And so I'm at the start of the beam. I have a portion of the beam before I make a cut. And I have the UDL W1 applied on this section of the beam. This point here was A. The distance to where I'm making a cut is the distance x and remembering the sign convention that we're choosing for shear forces so up on the left down on the right so this would be v pointing downwards if we make a cut on the right hand side and let's just remind ourselves of the equation we developed which links loading and shear forces and that is v equals v naught i.e. what v naught is what would the shear force be at the start of the section and then minus the integral of the loading over the section we're considering so this would go from point a all the way to point x or you might want to think of it as X, a point x naught where we're starting to the point x where we're looking at so and we can substitute into this equation so we can see straight away that the shear force at the end of the beam must be zero there's no forces coming from outside of the system so therefore v naught equals zero and then we have to take the integral between naught so we're taking a to be naught and x to be the distance away from a of the shear force w1 and we're integrating over dx and so that equals minus we still keep this minus sign because the load is pointing downwards of w1 times x by performing the integral and this is a definite integral so we're performing a definite integral between zero and x and we perform that integral and substitute with w1 equals 5 so we can finally write the shear force v equals minus 5x that will be in units of kilonewtons and this function is applicable for the values of where x lies in the region of zero and two meters along the beam. We're now going to proceed on to the section BC. And let's draw the free body diagram for that section. And I'm going to draw this all the way, for this section at least, all the way from A. 
So we have a UDL applied of W1. Before we hit the reaction B, so that's B, and then we have nothing along the beam for this section we're considering BC because the reaction force at C or the UDL that will start at C hasn't begun yet. So, and we're using our coordinate system where X goes all the way from A. So this would be A and at some distance, we'll just do this in a gray pen, at some distance a little bit further along would be the point C and then we would get the next UDL kick in. Okay, so now I'm gonna redraw this UDL, this, sorry, this free body diagram. And for this case, what I'm gonna do is start the free body diagram, make a cut here, and I'm gonna start this free body diagram from B. I already know the value of the shear force at B, so I don't need to recalculate what happened in the section AB. And this value that I already know becomes our V naught that we're using in this equation. And then before we hit a point C, we have another cut along the beam, and we have no loading at this point. But we do have, just at B, we have the reaction RBY, and we do have VB acting just at the edge of this beam as well and up on the left down on the right I'm assuming there to be a shear force at the section where we've made a cut. So reminding ourselves of that equation we have V equals V naught minus the integral of W dx. So in this case V naught was equal to minus 5x, which we'll calculate, plus RBY. And then our shear would just start at this point, just to the right of RBY on our section BC. So let's substitute in the value. We have minus 5 times 2 is the distance to point B plus RBY, which we calculate to be minus 9, so therefore V0 equals minus 1 kilonewtons. And now we're going to do the second part of the equation, which is the minus W dx. And in this case, integral of W dx is equal to 0 because there's no load upon this portion of the section portion of the beam. So therefore V equals minus 1 for all of the values where X lies between 2 meters and 3 meters. So the shear force is constant along this section. So we're going to proceed now onto section CD of the beam. Section C, D. And quickly scroll back up and just remind ourselves where C, D is. So we're at the point three meters away from A and where the UDL W2 begins. And so scroll back down. So let's remind ourselves of what the full system looks like. all of the way from A. So we had a reaction force at B, a bit of a gap at C, and then we get the load W2, and before we had W1, and our coordinate X is measured all the way from point A and to the point 
where we're going to make a cut. And I'm going to draw the free body diagram for this section. We could use this as the free body diagram, but we also know from our equation we can begin our free body diagram at point C. So here is C. Let's draw that free body diagram. So from point C, moving to where we make a cut in the beam. So we have the UDL W2. We have the shear force VC from the rest of the beam to the left of the section that we're considering, and up on the left, down on the right, V for where we're making the cut. So we would have had a further distance going back this way of three meters, and our X is as we move along this section. So the first thing we do is ascertain what our V0 is. And so we can just take V0 as equal to the value of the shear force calculated on the previous section. The previous section, the shear force was constant. So we don't need to calculate anything. It's not in terms of X. So V0 is simply minus one kilonewtons. And then we'll calculate our integral of W dx which equals W2 into X or minus three. And therefore we can write our full shear force function as V equals minus one minus W2 into X minus three. And that is applicable between X equals three meters and six meters. So now we're going to move on to section DE. Let's just remind ourselves what section DE is from the original diagram. So it is at the point, we have two, three, four, five, six meters along where the UDLW2 stops until we hit the reaction at E. And there is no external loading on this section whatsoever. So let's scroll down, right down. So first of all, we need to calculate what our V0 value is. And what we'll use is our shear force function from the previous section and we're going to evaluate it at the value where x was equal to six meters to get our shear force just at the start of our new section so v naught equals v six meters and therefore our previous function is applicable and um, Substituting the numbers in, we had minus one, let's get that on the screen, minus one, minus W2, which was two kilonewtons per meter, into X minus three, so X equals six, minus three, and we carry out this multiplication and evaluate that the function is minus seven kilonewtons and it's constant across the whole section and this function is applicable between x equals six meters until we hit the reaction force and that occurs at seven meters. Finally we can move on to the final section of this beam. Again, we're going to scroll up. So we need to calculate what the value of the shear force is at E. And then, so we're expecting with no load, a constant shear force as we move along E. And then what the value will then turn into when we hit the point F. Section EF. 
So our previous section took us to the point just before E and just before the reaction force comes along at E. So let's just quickly remind ourselves. Oh, that's not a particularly good drawing. Let's remind ourselves of what we had. So we have from A to B for two meters, we have a UDL of W1. Then we have straight away the reaction RBY. We had a gap of a meter before we have the UDL W2. Another gap of a meter before we hit point E. And we had REY was 17 kilonewtons. And finally we go along to point F where we have an applied 10, 10 kilonewton load. So on the section between E and F, what we need to calculate is our V naught. And again, our previous section, we knew that we had a constant shear force of minus seven kilonewtons. So we'd have minus seven kilonewtons just before we hit point E. So at a point E, we're going to have two values for the shear fu function. We have minus seven just to the left. And then we're going to have another value just to the right. And that is the minus seven plus the reaction force 17. So that will become plus 10 just to the right of the point of application of the load. And then we can move along the beam until we, and this 10 is going to be applicable because we have, this would become our V naught. V naught, so V equals V naught minus the integral of the loading dx. And there's no loading over the section until we hit point F. So our shear force for the section EF is equal to 10, and that's in kilonewtons, and that is applicable for where X is between two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven meters, which is where point E is, and 10 meters, which just before the point load F is applied, of 10 kilonewtons is applied at F. And then at point F, again we will have two, we'll have a sharp jump in the shear force diagram. It will go from the 10, which is constant across the section EF, and then we'll dive back down by a value of 10 kilonewtons. So we'll have two values, 10 and zero kilonewtons at point F itself. So we're going to collect all of these functions together and draw our shear force diagram. You could do this in a spreadsheet if you wanted to and get the spreadsheet to graph the function for you for all the different sections. But I'm just going to do this very quickly and qualitatively. What I always like to do when drawing a shear force diagram and later bending moment diagrams is remind myself of the original beam and like I did at the start for identifying the sections so let's put W1 and at this point here we had a pin support and we had a bit of a gap and I had W2 a bit of a gap before the roller support and finally the section EF and then I have the load of 10 kilonewtons applied at the end and let's see if I can do this neatly is when I'm drawing shear force and bending moment diagrams I like to drop lines down vertical lines down on the page much easier with pen and paper than it is on a Surface Pro let's try anyway Drop these vertical lines down on the page, 
to show where the different sections we considered are. And then the next thing to do is draw ourselves a nice x axis for the shear force. Again, I'm going to use a straight line tool that I've got available to me to try and make this a little bit neat. Um, this will be the distance x in meters on my x axis, and a y axis is going to be v in kilonewtons. And my initial value at point A for my shear force diagram is always going to be zero. And my function that I got for this section of the beam was minus 5x. So we have a linear function, but with no, um, so y equals mx plus c. We only have the mx, the gradient, but we don't have a starting point, or starting point is zero. So starting at zero, and it's a negative gradient of minus 5x until we reach the point b. So let's even write out a, b, c, d, e, and f to remind ourselves. And then at b, we would expect we have the vertical reaction RBY. First of all, that's minus 5x. This was 2 meters. So that gives me a total value of 10 at this vertices, or minus 10. And then I had a reaction of 9. And that's a vertical jump, which takes me to the value of minus 1. Between B and C, we had a constant shear force of minus 1 across the section. So we have a horizontal section there. And then we get the UDL W2. So starting from minus 1, and we had a total of W2 was equal to 2 kilonewtons per meter multiplied by the 3 meters. So we're going to drop by a total of 6. So that will become minus 7. So integral W dx. So the total load between C and D was 6 and pointing downwards and we have a UDL so that will be a linear function. Between D and E we have no change in the load so we get a constant function it remains at minus 7 for this entire section. When we get to E we had a vertical reaction force applied and so we have a jump in our shear force diagram to the point where the shear force is 10 at this point and between E and F let's try and get this relatively to scale even if it looks untidy so that's point E between E and F we have constant shear force because we have no load so we remain at 10 all the way along until point F when we have the 10 kilonewton external force applied and that takes us all the way back down to zero at this point so on this diagram always label up important points where you get a change in the shape so we have zero minus 10 jump to minus one that's constant all along if you like even label but that's still minus one then we have a point here which is minus 7, minus 7, a jump to E which gets us to a value of 10, and then a jump back down to a value of 0. And to complete this, we normally like to shade the diagram in as well. And that is our final shear force diagram. A couple of little points were, this is actually quite a complicated, we have one, two, three, four, five different loadings on there. We have five different portions to consider. We could have took our all of our shear force functions and just keep going back to A and having all of the previous things, but you could always, if I know, say, for CD, I know the value at C, I can just move onwards from C. Sometimes what you might do for simplicity is for sections 
A, B and B, C, you might go from A and then decide to go from F for other sections, whatever suits. Just be careful if you're going from the right hand side to the left hand side, but you're using a different coordinate system to using X from the left hand side. And also when drawing your free body diagrams, Remember the convention that we're choosing, which was up on the left, down on the right. So the unknown shear force V would now be on the left-hand side of the section and pointing upwards.